Hello and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 82, Germany Prepares for War Part 5, More Boats. This week, I would like to remind everyone that one of the quickest and easiest ways that you can support the podcast is by dropping a positive review for the podcast on your podcast listening service of choice, or by simply recommending it to your internet or real-world social circle. Believe it or not, old-fashioned word of mouth is still an important way that people find out about things, including podcasts, including this podcast. Last episode, we discussed the course of the German Navy during the 1920s and early 1930s, culminating with the design of the Scharnhorst-class battleships and the Hipper-class heavy cruisers. These two ships represent a good place to start this episode as well, because they were an important turning point for the German Navy. I feel like the temptation with the ship classes during the 1930s is to immediately start diving into numbers. Gun caliber, speed, armor thickness, armor placement, armor angles, anti-aircraft guns, etc, etc. With the Scharnhorst and Hipper classes, we could dive into those numbers, and they are in many cases meaningful choices around what the Germans believed was the best ship designs based on their construction capabilities and available materials. I could also start comparing the ships to those being built by other navies at the time, but I think at the moment I will avoid those detailed number-based discussions. Instead, I think a great place to start is to talk about what the ships represented for the Kriegsmarine. They were the first major classes of ships built after Hitler came to power, and as part of the much larger construction programs, and they were no longer handicapped by some of the stringent requirements of the Versailles Treaty, thanks mostly to the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. And they also kind of made one thing very clear. Regardless of how the Germans planned to use their naval surface fleet, they had very decisively reverted back to what was clearly naval orthodoxy of the mid-1930s. They were building steam turbine-powered battleships and heavy cruisers that looked a lot like what everybody else was building at the same time around the world. There were certainly differences, and some of those differences were impactful, because every navy had its own set of limitations and differing opinions on how the various facets of designs should be weighed against each other during the design process, but they were clearly kind of of the same type. I think this is interesting and important because in the early 1930s, Germany did have a chance, due to the fact that its navy essentially did not exist, to try something different. The Deutschland class had been really different than what other navies were building at the same time. They were incredibly flawed for a lot of reasons, but they were different. Some of those differences can and probably should be heavily criticized in retrospect, But at the time, they caused serious consternation among Germany's possible enemies all over Europe. With the Scharnhorst and Hipper classes, the Kriegsmarine reverted back to building along the same lines as everybody else. There were a whole host of reasons for the decision to pursue such a path, everything from the personal views of Reeder and Hitler, to the treaty agreements with Britain, to the societal ideas of what a navy was, and a whole bunch of other reasons. Nowhere was this more clear than the largest ships built for the Kriegsmarine in time for the Second World War, the Bismarck-class battlecruisers. We will talk about that class of ships, as well as the other very iconic tool used by the German Navy, the U-boats, before we finish up by discussing Germany's massive naval plans formulated in the last years before the war, Plan Z, which would have represented another massive expansion of German naval power, none of which actually ended up happening. While building the Scharnhorst class, the Germans were always going to build more battleships. Initially, those were basically just more Scharnhorst class ships. But there was a change that happened sort of on the international naval sphere uh, in the mid-1930s. And that's because at that time, other nations, and particularly Italy and France, began to build new battleships. This was allowed for the first time since 1921 by the Washington and London Naval Treaties, because after so many years, many of the oldest battleships present in various navies were reaching the age at which they could be retired and replaced. Now, there were limitations on what could replace them, specific size limitations that we'll get to here in a bit, but those older ships could be replaced. 
The first round of construction would result in the Richelieu class for the French and the Littorio class for the Italians. These ships represented some of the first new designs to begin construction since the treaties had been signed, and the Germans felt that they needed to respond to their larger size and power. They would both mount 15-inch guns and would be claimed to fit within the 35,000-ton displacement limit of the treaty system, but would come in thousands of tons higher than that limit, which a lot of people did. The Bismarck was designed to match up with these ships, kind of in the same way that the French had designed the Richelieu's in response to the Italian Latorios. For the new German ships, kind of in the same way that the Scharnhorst class had started as the Deutschland class but then was then scaled up, the Bismarck began life as a scaled up Scharnhorst. The first thing to increase in size were the guns, up to 14 inches from the 11 inch guns on the Scharnhorst. But then this required other redesigns which quickly spooled out into what was eventually an entirely new ship. The biggest problem is that they wanted to keep the speed quite high, with the original plan being to have the ship that could make 33 knots. But they could not do this within the basic Scharnhorst design once the ship became much heavier due to the larger guns. These kind of spiraling out of design changes is one of the reasons that you see ships from this period with what seem like odd design choices, because they were often driven by a desire not to completely rework the design. The example I often use for this is the 14-inch guns that were placed on the King George V class for the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was aware that other navies had went with larger guns, but they were too late in the design process to change the guns without delaying the ships so they stuck with the smaller guns so that they could get the ships quicker. For the Bismarck, once it became clear that a complete redesign was going to have to happen, the guns were increased up to 15 inches, or 388 millimeters, to match the French and Italians. The goal of that 33 knot top speed proved to be out of reach, and so the top speed was lowered to 30 knots, which would still be as fast as the Latorios and faster than the Richelieu. All of this also meant an increase in total design displacement up to 40,000 tons, although the eventual actual displacement would be 41,000 tons. As I always like to point out, I am unaware of a single capital ship class that actually met its design displacement after it was constructed. They all seem to come a bit on the heavy side. If anybody has an opposite example, please let me know. Along with it being a big ship that they wanted to go really fast, the designers were back to a discussion of what kind of propulsion technology they wanted to use. As a reminder, for the Scharnhorst class, the diesel engine design had been abandoned, out of concern that it could not be scaled up enough to meet the demands of larger ships. But when the German designers were allowed to design a whole new ship, the diesels reappeared. As it turns out, there was a disagreement between the German ship design group, who really liked those diesels, and most of the leadership of the German Navy, like Admiral Reeder, who preferred the more common steam turbine approach. In a fun twist, the design actually got quite far with the diesel engines still in it. And in fact, it would still have diesels in 1935, not long before construction would begin. This would have made the ship kind of one of a kind if the design had been carried through, but of course it wasn't. The change had to be made back to steam when the manufacturer for the diesel engines backed away from its commitment that it would be able to build engines of appropriate size and power that would be able to work within the ship. This caused some design ripple effects because the diesels uh, provided one great advantage and that was range. In its diesel powered configuration, the Bismarck had been designed with a range of 14,000 miles or over 22,000 kilometers. This would have far outranged the French and Italians, although to be fair, the Italians, you know, really limited their range. It was low on their priority list. The change back to steam power meant that they had to make some design changes to allow for more fuel to be carried. And this was done by changing some of the trimming tank capacity, tanks that would be filled with oil at the start of the cruise. This would allow for an eventual range of about 8,500 miles or just over 13,000 kilometers. This put it roughly in line with what the French had designed for the Richelieu class. After the design was finalized and construction began, and even after construction was complete, there would be several changes to the ship before and during the war, much like with any capital ship during this period. For an example, an Atlantic bow would be added to make it more capable of sailing in the rougher Atlantic seas, 
Radar would also be fitted to the ship, with the early German naval radars focused on surface search instead of aerial search. At the time, this made sense because the radar was much more crude and less precise, and the early German radar had some problems identifying aircraft positions. Also, during the mid-1930s, giving a ship aerial radar, especially a battleship, was only sort of useful. The knowledge that an air raid was inbound could not really alter their course of action, as at the time, there, there was no accompanying carrier of, or some other method of rapidly increasing protection from air attack. The only planes carried by the Bismarck would be four float planes that were used for spotting and reconnaissance. The Bismarck would be launched on February 14, 1939. In the spirit of Valentine's Day, Hitler would pour out his love for the ship at the launching ceremony, saying, quote, German designers, engineers, and shipyard workers have created the mighty hull of this proud giant which will ride the waves. May the German sailors and officers who have the honor utilizing this ship always prove to be worth of its namesake. May the spirit of the Iron Chancellor be transmitted to them. May it accompany them in all of their actions on their fortunate journeys in pace. But if it should ever be necessary, may it lead them to the hardest hour of their fulfillment of duty. End quote. Which was, you know, somewhat prophetic. It would then take about a year and a half before the ship was commissioned in August 1940 and the Kriegsmarine would have at its disposal the largest ship in the history of the German Navy, and the second largest that it would ever produce, with the turpits being just a bit heavier due to some design modifications. The question was, what would they do with it? This problem circles back to a bit of what we discussed last episode, which was about how the Germans planned to use their new capital ships when it came to a war. Between the time that the ship was laid down in July 1936, and when it came into service, the entire outlook of the Kriegsmarine had changed. When it had been designed, the primary enemy that it was sort of aimed against was France, but then when it came into service, they were at a war with the Royal Navy. The plan, as outlined by Reeder and accepted by Hitler and Blomberg, had been to use all of Germany's surface vessels in various commerce raiding campaigns. But such campaigns were very different when launched against just France or when France had Britain as an ally. Just the sheer weight of numbers caused problems in a conflict with the Royal Navy, and removed whatever small possibility of meeting enemy ships on an equal footing or anything close to it. But the Bismarck had not been, really been designed from the beginning as a commerce raider. It was designed to meet primarily French ships in battle, and commerce raiding took a very different set of attributes. The biggest problems were speed and range, as outlined by German Captain Helmuth Hay, who would describe the problem of using German battleships in the commerce rating capacity like this. Quote, A breakup of the battleship unit to carry out cruiser warfare is not possible so long as the individual battleship lacks superior speed and operational range to elude continuous contact and a combination of our opponent's superior forces. Our individual battleships as presently constructed would soon fall victim to superior enemy forces without achieving commensurate results. End quote. You'll note that Hay does not criticize the utility of having surface vessels that perform raiding duties on enemy commerce, just that Germany had created the wrong ships for the job. If a full commitment to surface raiding had been a decision made in 1935 instead of several years later, different decisions may have been made in the design. Speed and range probably would have been more prioritized, which would have spiraled out into all other kinds of changes. But it was not all bad. The Bismarck was still a powerful ship and the Royal Navy would certainly be very concerned when it launched. My own opinion on it, and this is something we'll dive into much more when we get to the episodes on, on the operation that would see the Bismarck at the bottom of the ocean, is that while the ship may not have been the best surface raider, it was certainly a really good ship to cause the Royal Navy to pour a ton of time and resources into its pursuit and eventual sinking. I have no doubt that a ship designed specifically for commerce raiding from the very beginning would have performed better, but also a big part of the problem comes down to the specifics of the mission that the Bismarck was sent on and the lack of available support, something we'll get to a lot more later. But if the Bismarck was not from the start designed for commerce raiding, but commerce raiding was seen as an essential piece of German strategy, then we should probably talk about ships that were designed for exactly that purpose. Or I guess boats, not ships. And they boats that are primarily prefaced by the letter. Up until this point, 
in these two episodes, I have not really talked about U-boats. And of course, they have to be discussed anytime you talk about the German Navy before or during the Second World War. They are probably the most famous contribution of the German Navy to the story of the war, or certainly they're in the top three. The German U-boat campaign of the First World War had been very successful at sinking ships in both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. In fact, some of the most successful months of either conflict would be in the spring of 1917 with the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. This made them an important target during the armistice and then the eventual peace agreements. In the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans were forbidden from pursuing any further submarine usage, and they were also banned from further construction and development of their submarines. However, they would be able to circumvent some of these restrictions during the 1920s by setting up a design bureau in Holland called IVS, which would continue to process designs and and test changes to the submarines that had been used during the First World War. IVS would also use its knowledge of submarines to work with other nations that also wanted to build them, which was a great way to continue to work through new ideas and to see them in practice. Many of the advancements made during this period were not what you would call flashy. I might even go so far as to call them hidden. Things like shifting from a system where wires were used for control surfaces and instead moving to hydraulics. These type of changes were important and were meaningful improvements to performance, while at the same time not being exactly newsworthy. While IVS was good at some of these design changes, it did not solve all the problems that the ban on submarine construction would cause, problems that were particularly problematic in the areas of industrial tooling and retaining skilled workers. There were a similar set of problems in all areas of naval construction in Germany and in other nations, due to the drastic reductions in construction demands in the post-war years, and and then continuing restrictions of the treaty system. But at least for other types of ships, there was often at least some kind of construction project to hold over some workers, even if they were often much smaller projects or non-military related. Germany had nothing similar to a U-boat to build. But all of that changed in 1932 when the German Navy began to plan on resuming submarine construction in the following years. The first new prototype would be constructed in February 1935, and it would be built as secretly as possible. Secrecy was considered so important that it was actually built outside of Germany, shipped into the country in pieces, and then assembled. The initial construction plans were relatively modest, with a fleet of just 16 submarines being the first milestone. What is interesting is the small number compared to other types of ships in the same construction plans. For example, the plan with 16 submarines was also the same construction plan that saw the Navy planning on creating six battleships and an aircraft carrier. I like to point this out because, as we will discuss in just a moment, the German U-boat construction projects during the 1930s were always pretty modest in size, especially when you compare them to the other programs and the other ships they were trying to build. They were seen as complementary to the rest of the Navy, but in no way the most important part of the Kriegsmarine. This seems particularly odd given the role that they would later play in the war, and their reputation both during the war and after. During 1938, at a time when they would have both the Bismarck, the Tirpitz, three heavy cruisers, an aircraft carrier, and a whole bunch of smaller ships either in construction or nearing the end, the Germans would build just nine medium-sized submarines. Medium being the size that was most useful for the core kind of commerce rating function in European and North Atlantic waters, where the bulk of the shipping would be targeted. The next year, 1939, they would not do much better, with just 12 being originally planned. Uh, Plans that obviously changed when the war started. During these years, Karl Donitz, who would be in command of the U-boat forces and later would replace Reeder at the head of the Kriegsmarine, constantly advocated for a larger emphasis on U-boat construction, but specifically a greater emphasis on the types of U-boats that he felt were best suited to the task of commerce raiding. Donitz believed that a force of 300 medium U-boats would be able to sink a million tons of shipping per month, and if they could sink shipping at that rate for an extended period of time, enemy, any enemy, even the British, would very quickly simply run out of ships. The estimated shipping capacity available to Britain was around 17.5 million tons during the late 1930s, 
And this type of math checked out if you believed in the ability of the U-boats to sink the numbers that Donitz was estimating. But there was some disagreements among German naval leaders around what kind of U-boats should be built to achieve the best results. Donitz heavily favored medium designs, particularly the Type 7, which had been originally designed in 1933, and was really focused on what was seen as the best characteristics for a submarine that wanted to directly attack enemy shipping and then evade enemy defenses. Other leaders wanted more resources put into some of the larger designs, which could stage longer-range patrols, with the downside that they were more lethargic when it came to the ability to maneuver in close quarters. The ability to evade was seen as more critical due to the advancements in British anti-submarine capabilities that had been growing during and after the First World War. The British would put a lot of faith in their ASDIC uh, sonar technology, and some would say too much faith, as they believed that it was the perfect answer against further German U-boat attacks. There were concerns in Germany that that it might be really effective, but there was some hope that there could be tactics that would could be used to get around the largest problems sort of that Azdec presented by kind of utilizing Azdec's limitations particularly its range which was only around 1.5 miles not to dive too deep into the events of the war but during its early stages Azdec would prove to be less effective as a countermeasure than the British had hoped and the German U-boats would do quite well However, they never reached the numbers that Donitz believed was required for the U-boat campaign to be completely successful, although, of course, they certainly sank a lot of ships. And during 1938, and after Hitler announced Germany's withdrawal from the Anglo-German Naval Treaty on April 28th, German naval planning began to consider the Royal Navy not just as a possible enemy in a future conflict, but its primary focus. The key caveat to this focus was that Hitler assured the German Navy and its leadership that there would not be a war with Britain until 1944. This kind of time horizon was important because it would give six years for the Kriegsmarine to grow and expand its fleet before it would be called upon to go to war with the Royal Navy. Six years seems like a lot of time, but within the general kind of schedule of how naval rearmament works, it was much more limiting. To determine how to best utilize the time and resources available, a reader would ask Commander Hay, head of the operational section, to prepare a plan for what should be done in a war with Britain. Hay would favor the cruiser warfare approach that Germany would use during the Second World War, even if he did not believe that the ships that Germany had already built were best suited for that approach, as I mentioned earlier. What he firmly rejected was any attempt by Germany to recreate the situation that it had at the beginning of the First World War, where the Imperial Navy had attempted to create a force that was designed to meet the Royal Navy head-on in open battle in the North Sea. Hay instead believed that any Jutland-type scenario or other major naval battle should be avoided at all cost. Instead, all surface resources would be prepared and used for commerce raiding, where they would augment the available U-boats, which Hay did not believe would be able to get the job done by themselves. To prepare the fleet for this rule against the much larger Royal Navy, there would have to be a massive expansion of the surface fleet, although all existing and under construction ships were also thought to be important pieces of that future fleet. This included two Bismarck-class two Scharnhorst-class battleships, the Deutschland-class Panzerschiff cruisers, the Hipper-class of heavy cruisers, and then, you know, many smaller ships. Beyond these ships, several of which were still under construction, a new and massive construction plan was devised, which would go through several iterations called Plan X and then Y, before finally landing on Z, which was put in place. The overriding goal of Plan Z designs was that they had to be technically better than whatever the British were building at the time, which was a requirement that came directly from Hitler, and also was, it was also based on the reasonably sound logic that the Germans were never going to have more ships than the British, so the ships they did have had to be of high quality. This would end up including six H-class battleships, which would be larger than the Bismarck class in every way, with 16-inch guns inside a roughly 58,000-ton displacement. By 1944, the plan would be to have four of those H-class battleships in the fleet, along with four newer and updated Panzerschiff, two aircraft carriers, and four more heavy cruisers. 
The planning would also extend beyond the 1944 date when it was very likely that war would begin. And I'll go all the way to 1948, which is kind of where the Plan Z stopped. At that point, all six H-class battleships would be completed, uh, the number of new panzer ships would be increased to 12, aircraft carriers would be brought up to 8, and heavy cruisers up to 24. There would also be 194 U-boats built by 1944, and almost 250 by 1948, with 88 of them being larger U-boats and U-cruisers, which Donuts hated, but a lot of other people really liked. All of this represented a massive, massive expansion, and I'm not going to dive too deep into the details of a lot of these designs. In many cases, they were larger and more capable than what the Germans had previously built, but they were also often in a relatively early stage of design by the time that they were cancelled by the start of the war. The best example of this is that, at least in some of the initial designs for those Type H battleships, they were back to diesel engines. The idea that would never die, even though I find it almost impossible to believe that they would have stuck around until the final design stages. Instead, when the war started, even the very beginning phases of the expansion were not yet complete or even really started, which meant that nothing that was planned was generally available to the German Navy during the war, although it has proved very profitable ground for the you know, many, many episodes of, I don't know, Nazi secret mega, mega projects or something like that that is on TV from time to time. Only a handful of the large ships that were under construction in September 1939 would actually continue, and only the Bismarck Tirpitz and the cruiser Prince Eugen would actually be completed, and they really came from the pre-Plan Z expansion plans, not from Plan Z itself. While the German dreams were big, at the end of the day, they were just dreams. The reality was something quite different. I think the best place to end an episode on the preparations of the Kriegsmarine for a war is this quote from Donitz, who would write this a couple of days after the war started, and he would say, quote, Seldom indeed has any branch of the armed forces of a country gone to war so poorly equipped it could in fact do more, no more than subject the enemy to a few odd pinpricks. End quote. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode, where we will look at the Luftwaffe and its preparations for war, and how it planned to organize its forces in a...